All right. I will say that I've been excited for this show. I've been excited for this next show, this next episode of All Three Phases here, brought to you by WV Sports Now. That's, of course, West Virginia football legend Rasheed Marshall, and I'm Mike Osti, and I've been excited for this show, and I don't want to say that losing is better by any means, because I know the fan base obviously wants this team to win, and obviously I want to cover some victories as well. This West Virginia program right now coming off of the loss to Texas, and as we speak right now, sitting at 2-3 and three and 0-2 and in conference play, But I'm excited when the team does lose to hear the thoughts of a West Virginia football legend like Rasheed Marshall because there's been a lot of debate on the state of this program right now and what the expectations should be for a program like the West Virginia Mountaineers. We are going to cover all of that. So you, the fans, you're discussing a lot amongst yourself on what people should expect. You're going to hear from Rasheed Marshall and maybe what you should expect or what he expects out of this football program year in and year out. We're going to talk about West Virginia's loss to Texas and then the upcoming game against Baylor at home under the lights, another night game. Uh, I it just it just seems like it's out of control here with the night games. This one another it one never at be home. Out of control. I guess I guess all they got to win more of them. They have the win in Blacksburg. They lost the home night game at Kansas, so this now more pressure to do it under the lights at home. Yeah. Again, this one, a Thursday night affair. So another Thursday night one, and this one in Morgantown. And yeah, Thursday night games, Thursday night games, they're exciting. I know they were when you played. They were when I was in college. They still are now, but it puts more pressure, more the magnifier on the program on national TV. And I'm also going to ask Rashid about the situation of maybe concussion protocol from when he was playing to now, because West Virginia did have C.J. Donaldson leave that Texas game and now is a part of the concussion protocol in college football and obviously what's happened in the NFL with Tua and the Dolphins and that whole mess and situation. So, Rashid, I do want to kind of, number one, ask you about the Texas game and then moving to this Baylor game and kind of what unfolded there because it does feel like West Virginia was kind of – you know, mismatched against the Longhorns. This is a Longhorns team that just lost a week earlier against Texas Tech. That's an average team. You don't feel like Texas is this overpowering force right now, despite what the brand is. They almost beat Alabama, which is obviously something to, to say, but yep. they then got exposed, and West Virginia was riding high off a two-game win streak regardless of who they played. And then you just, from the jump, they really had no chance against the Longhorns, who just were firing all cylinders was it simply that West Virginia maybe was a bad matchup there? Was there something maybe the defense once again kind of let the team down? What kind of went down in that game for you? Because they never had a chance in that game. The final score was 38 to 20, but it, it could have been 50 to nothing. They, they, they were really done yeah. from the opening quarter all the way through. They came out pretty hot. And I'll say this, you know, you can't necessarily, because they did play Alabama pretty well. Now, yeah. That matchup, Alabama is going to get everyone's best shot. We all know Alabama is the top dog. You go into an Alabama game, you're going to bring the best product possible. Um, you know, West Virginia, again, when you look at the matchup on paper, um, you really don't know how that's going to look because, yes, Texas did play Bama well, but can they bring that same energy versus a West Virginia? Um, yeah. And you said it, West Virginia was outmatched from start to finish. Um, one thing that I noticed from you know, from the opening kickoff was West Virginia just seemed to step slower. They just seemed to step behind as if the game was moving a little too fast for them and they could never catch up. Uh, The yardage was very tough for them to get. I thought it was not a lot of breathing room and everything was just a grind. So, yeah, um, I think that showed me that Texas came out. They looked to be a little more prepared. Uh, They executed a lot better defensively flying around. And just on offense, we, we had a very hard time just finding some breathing room. And, you know, the bad thing about this league and any other league that you're playing, yeah. it's a copycat league. So what the next team sees on film, they're going to try to mimic it, do the same exact thing until West Virginia finds an answer for it. Yeah, and you bring that up all the time, and it's very, very true. And Neil Brown brings up that the Big 12 is a tough conference to play in. Obviously not the level of the Big 10 or the SEC, but still pretty pretty freaking tough. A lot of ranked teams are there this year. The schedule tougher this year than even last year with the out-of-conference matchups too. And 
that's an excuse. It does. It's not going to be something that anybody wants to hear, but that does exist this year. And there's also talk the Big 12 cannibalizing itself with everyone beating up on everybody. So yep. who knows what's going to happen to the future of Texas or the future of West Virginia because they now have a matchup with Baylor. Baylor, a team that just lost to Oklahoma State, but that's a top 10 team. Baylor's been a ranked team all year. They're a team that feels like legit ball game, if not more. They thought they were going to have a chance to maybe buy for the conference title, which I guess they still could have that opportunity. What do you see from that matchup with Baylor coming up here? Because it seems like a game that a lot of Mountaineer fans feel like maybe Baylor is vulnerable, maybe something Baylor is overrated, and it's a game that West Virginia could win. But obviously, if you look at the Vegas odds here, and you look at the records, and you look at how the rankings have been, Baylor is going to be favored, but a 3-2 and two team, they certainly have lost before. Yeah, they de- they, they've lost some games. They're definitely beatable. Um, but I think for West Virginia, the main thing, focus here is to concentrate on yourself at the moment yeah we're we're in desperate need of a win um i think you have more things to correct in-house versus worrying about uh what baylor's going to do yes you do have the game plan you do have to prepare uh from an x's and o's standpoint but you have more issues in your own house to figure out to get corrected um you have somewhat of a of an extended yeah, week to get it done <laughs> Yeah. And uh, yeah, we can we can figure things out from there. But I think the main focus should be West Virginia focusing on West Virginia and uh, X's and O's should take care of itself. But yeah. it's, it's going to be another fast game. A lot of speed on Baylor's end. And it, it could possibly look a lot like not score wise, but it could look like the Texas game in terms of, you know, how to how the game flows. Yeah, and that Texas game was you had one standout player in Xavier Worthy who really exploded and kind of took over the game. And I actually wrote a piece on WB Sports Now that that was a game that you really wanted to have Charles Woods in because you figure that he's going to go against the top guy, going to at least contain the top guy. It didn't happen. Xavier Worthy, three tight touchdowns, two as a receiver, threw one, 21 points for just him. The team only scored 20, so he basically beat West Virginia on his own when you include the extra points. And that and that's just something that's a recipe for disaster, of course. Bad day for the defense. Offense had their worst day, but they also were coming from behind most of that game. And Baylor won't be easy, but maybe as a winnable game in conference, a game they definitely need to win. But you did talk about kind of fixing in-house first, and I think that's very, very important right now. And that'll segue. Rasheed Marshall, Mike Osti here. It is all three phases here on WV Sports Now, and you can also find us anywhere you can hear podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, tune in, etc. We're there also here on our YouTube channel. But one thing that I think needs fixed, and there are countless issues here. So I do push back on fans when they want to bring this up as like the reason they lost the game. There are plenty of reasons why this team is losing games. But one thing that I think is maybe the most annoying, <laughs> if yeah. I had to rank the annoying reasons why this team is losing is the receiver drop issues. JT Daniels right now remains as a top 25 golden arms quarterback in the country. He's having a great year. Okay. He's kind of quieting some doubters before when he was hurt a lot. He looks to be a guy that could play at the next level, if not be a coach, a very, very smart quarterback and a great leader. So he's finding the weapons, but seven drops against Texas. Yep. Bryce Four Wheaton has even dropped some balls. He dropped that critical pass in the backyard brawl. He's got over it. He's had a great year, but you're still seeing drops. Caden Prather has really emerged as a favorite, but to say he's not dropped a pass wouldn't be true. Sam James has dropped critical pass after critical pass. Reed Smith, etc. Down the line, all the way from Olaton as a tight end, and now you're going to have C.J. Donaldson, who we'll get to later. He's going to be missing some time, so he won't be able to pick up the slack as a receiver in addition as a runner for you. As a QB, who's a leader of this team, how do you help to correct this drop issue? Neil Brown talked about just being a fundamental issue. Are you just throwing basically regular routes and practice to get them back to the fundamentals? What needs to be done here? And how frustrating is this for JT Daniels, who's having a solid year? He's not going to throw anybody under the bus, but seven drops in a game is too much. And that's a big game. And is a factor at this point. The drop issue just got to get cleaned up. So not to go down a deep, dark hole here, but. You're let's, welcome let's to. Break, You're a legend. Let's, let's you can go down, down all right? Like to. So go ahead. Here's, here's what we're going to do, all right? Uh, you only have so much time within a practice, all right? There's going to be special teams. There's going to be offensive breakdowns. You have your situational uh, period. You have your individual periods. 
there's no time during practice for a receiver to get extra time to get uh, extra, extra catches in. Okay. That has to happen outside of the coach's eye. That has to happen after practice. Um, so it starts from within. You know, if, if it's a unit, if it's a, a unit type of issue, whoever the leader is in that group, whether it's Sam James, Bryce Fort Wheaton, right. you got to get the guys together and say, okay, listen, we're going to get on this jugs machine after practice. We all need 50 balls each, 100 balls each, so we can try to correct this problem. As far as JT, I mean, it's listen, as a quarterback, you do your job. You try to put the ball yeah. to where the receiver can get it. They don't catch it. Listen, you go to the sideline. There's a million things going through your mind as a quarterback. You don't have time to say, hey, I need you to catch that ball. That's what that's the reason why they're out there, you know. Right. So, you know, I always like to try to tie it back to a field goal kicker mission to kick that next time up. You're thinking about not missing the kick versus just doing what you routinely do and knock the kick through the upright. Um, same instance, receiver. You put a ball on the ground, it's a crucial yeah. third and three. You're now saying to yourself, don't drop the ball. What do you do? You turn around and drop the ball. So subconsciously, there's something that you have to do. You have to play a little mind game to uh, to figure it out and get that demon out of your mind, man. That's that's the easiest way to describe it. But, um, yeah, once you get the drops, it's, uh, it's, it can be lingering. So hopefully yeah. they'll fix the issue. Yeah, and you had time as a receiver as well in the National Football League with the, with the Niners, right? I believe oh, yeah. the Niners. Yeah, yeah. So, Niners. yeah. So, did you ever have any mental issues drop wise? I mean, I, oh, yeah. I don't have any any tape of you just continuously dropping passes back there, but no, as no. You're in practice before the season. So, but did you ever have to get over that? Was it how did you how did you work at that from the receiver perspective? Because you can touch this from both. So ways. for me, it was it was it was punt returns. I put my first punt on the ground in camp. Okay. Um, and yeah, you just you just replaying that last drop through your mind. It's like now there's some really good guys out there, and I'll use uh, Pac-Man Jones for instance. Uh, Mountaineer Nation knows who Adam Pac-Man Jones is. Yeah, phenomenal special teams player. Could catch a punt. There's a video if you haven't seen it. He catches about seven balls in Dallas Cowboys camp, and it, and he's just just sticking them everywhere. <laughs> he puts one on the ground. You're not gonna worry about it because he's routine. He's he's just automatic. For a guy like myself. I'm new to it. Um, that can, you know, that can that can shake yeah. me up a little bit. And any other player as well. So, yeah, you just have to get the reps and become so comfortable. When you think you got it, you got to do it again. You have to get about five to ten more. And uh, just to be able to get to that level to where you truly feel that comfortable. So, yeah, for me it was uh, punt returns, not necessarily the pass catching. Um, so, yeah, you know, the problem, the the – correction to fix it the course is the same repetition yeah and i touched on all of this too in wv sports now as i head over to the site for some written content trying to analyze the drop issues and what it's meant for this team as well as the impact of not having charles woods in that texas game in particular that i brought up earlier on the defensive side but yeah no one better than rashid to touch on both angles there from qb and receiver and it's just an annoyance i, I mean i i get it any fan watching you, you see drop passes critical drops early in games. It just got to be an annoyance, even though there certainly are other issues that exist. Rashid, what I also want to touch on here, and this is kind of an important conversation, and it's been a conversation that's existed in the National Football League, but then unfortunately also involved West Virginia and the West Virginia football program with the whole concussion conversation and now what the concussion protocol is. And Neil Brown kind of, I will tell you, at, at his media session this week, he kind of was even seemingly scared to talk about it and just said, hey, this is something that I just let be by the book. I don't try to micromanage this because we're talking concussions here. You also got to give DAP. Texas handled that perfectly. Their, 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 their medical staff and, and, and he gave them their due too because that was a road game. But C.J. Donaldson leaves the game, a knee to the head, late in the game. It's unfortunate all the way around, but really, really sucks in a game that was decided by that point. And he's been a really cool player to cover this year. I would say it's a bright right. spot for this team. The man didn't have a position, hadn't played running back before this year. If you look up to try to research him, you're still seeing him as a tight end. He's yep. playing running back. He's putting up numbers, doing things we haven't seen since Steve Slayton for West Virginia. And Leaves the game, has to be carted off, gives the thumbs up. That's all positive, but nobody knows. I mean, that, just getting the thumbs up, that kind of felt really to be a bad vibe 
uh, I'll say. And then you do hear the reports that he's moving to extremities. That's great. He was in stable condition. He then released a statement that he's going to be okay, but he's out. Who knows how long he'll be out. It's a freshman. They're certainly going to take care of him. He's in concussion protocol. And this is only a few days after the Dolphins had a situation with Tua where he had an injury that some think was a concussion. Some think was a back injury days earlier on that previous Sunday. He leaves that. He's all stumbling around. It looked like concussion to me, but I'm not a medical doctor. Yeah, they thought sure. it was officially a back. He then plays on Thursday just a few days later. All the former players in the Amazon broadcast were freaking out, saying he shouldn't have been out there, and basically crying that he was. He leaves that game, gets his bell rung. We don't know when he's going to play again as well, and now does have a concussion from there. Chris Nowinski, former WWE superstar, Harvard football player, does a lot with the, the concussion research. He touched on that he shouldn't have been out there. He thought it was a concussion from what he saw the previous Sunday. Yeah. I do want to, number one, ask you and a lot to unpack here. What was the concussion protocol to your understanding when you played? And this could go from college to even your appearance in the National Football League in your brief time with the NFL in terms of, you know, if you thought you sustained one, what – did it take to get you back on the field? Do you understand? Did you ever have an official concussion? Oh, Are yeah. there times now looking back that you're thinking, okay, it wasn't diagnosed as a concussion, but I probably have had more than actually were officially recorded now that we know more information. And then we'll certainly get to uh, CJ yeah. and Tua. So, so first and foremost, I want to say this because you touched on uh, CJ Donaldson, Donaldson's yeah. uh, concussion in Texas as a player whether you're on the Texas sideline, you, whether you're on the West Virginia sideline, you understand the severity of a player's injury when you get both medical staffs out, you get, um, you know, the stretcher, just all hands on deck. Yeah. You, you understand. So yeah. um, football at the end of the day is, is a brotherhood. Yes, you have two teams going to battle. Um, but whenever you get a situation like that, you come together, you never want to see another guy – although he's your opponent um, and of course not your teammate because yeah. you're all on the same path. You're all, you, you know, you have the same collective goal. So you just come together. You hope that player is okay, regardless of what side you're on. And, and that's where that starts and ends. Um, I can promise you no player on Texas team was clapping because that player was hurt. It's, it's a part of the game, unfortunately, and it can get serious as you just talked about Tua. Um, yes, I have had my fair share of concussions, diagnosed, undiagnosed. And again, um, you know, you, you look at to a situation, if you didn't see it, I'm sure you could pull it up somewhere on. Yeah. And this is the there. first one. Yeah. Um, you see the whiplash, the butt hits, the head hits. And I had a situation exactly the same way, knocked out, you know, everything went black, ball pops up in the air. You don't remember a thing. Um, but there's a ton of so-called medical experts at home who are the casual football fans <laughs> right? who are so barbaric. They just want to see another guy out there, you know, ah, uh, he's all right. Get him back in there. Stuff is serious. You can die from it. And yeah. with this, if this is the situation, um, the second concussion syndrome or, you know, however it's properly termed, that can, that can put you down. And if that is the case for Tua, um, you know, prayers up for him because your career could be cut short from it and uh, you're playing with your life, you know. Um, so I think there's something bigger to life than just football. Obviously, you want to see and hope that he's OK. But, uh, yeah, you can't play away, play around with it. I've had two diagnosed and I'm pretty sure at least two or three more that went undiagnosed because, again, that that severe blow to the head, you see a black spot. You kind of go out for a second, you shake it off. And the old school way is, hey, you got your bell rung, shake it off, get back in there, you're good to go. Could be a concussion. Yeah. 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 You're never really going to know how many you had, honestly. All three phases yeah. here, Rashid Marshall, Mike Osti, as we are talking the concussion protocol situation right now for CJ Donaldson here in the midst of this episode. So I'll ask you this, number one. Did you ever feel, because you brought up the whole barbaric mentality, and it's definitely changed from what it was when you were playing to now in terms of the mentality or what we even know about concussions. Changed a lot. How concussions yep. are being handled, and it's all for the better. Granted, it's for the better, which maybe makes it 
more frustrating when you see a Tua situation that some believe two concussions in a five-day period. That makes you maybe freak out even more. That's why there was all that backlash. And then, obviously, C.J. Donaldson just is an unforeseen thing that's so horrible. But did you ever feel pressure to return to action when you thought you had a concussion or in the midst of a concussion that was diagnosed? Did you, whether it be from a coach, a player, a fan, whatever, did you ever feel that pressure that I got to get out there and maybe you weren't really ready? Like, if you look back, do you ever think to yourself from 20 years ago, I shouldn't have played that game? Any true competitor, unless you have extreme uh, symptoms, the headaches, the the vomiting, the uh, light sensitivity, those things can keep you out. You can truly pinpoint, okay, these are my symptoms. I can truly just attach this to the concussion. In a lot of cases, you might not have any symptoms, but you have to make sure that you, you A, follow the doctor's orders, give your body, brain enough time to recover, and uh, you get back in there. That second one is, is very susceptible to happen, and if you get a right, the right blow, uh, knee to the head, whatever it may be, it can, it can take you out. So uh, you kind of have to just sit back, trust the, trust the doctors, and understand that they're in it you know, for the best of your health and uh, your long-term health, especially. So it's, it, it's definitely tough. Um, but yeah, I had a lot of, a, a lot of good people in my corner to just kind of sit me down and say, listen, there's, there's a bigger piece to this puzzle right here. And uh, you going out the next week is, is not worth your health and playing again. Right. Right. And, and I did even, even see some people saying, well, where's the culpability on Tua? Because he was saying it was a back injury, not a concussion. He was forcing himself out there as well. But it's hard to put it on the player. Any player worth a damn is going to want to be out there, especially when it's something that it's not a broken leg. You're not bleeding. You don't see something directly. So you're going to want to be out there. It is up to either a coach and someone on the medical staff. And the NFL is doing an investigation. The Dolphins claim they did everything on the up and up. They claim it was a back. He said it was a back. But I will then ask you. And again, we're not medical professionals here, both Rashid and myself. We don't have medical degrees. So um, obviously we could be incorrect, but I want to just get your assessment as a former player that you say has dealt with concussions, maybe some diagnosed, some undiagnosed. You brought up the video and you saw the video and I want to go to the Sunday before the Thursday game for Tua. So he then got his bell wrong on Tuesday, on, on Thursday, I mean, leaves the game, who knows about his future, but the Sunday before you saw the video. The NFL has the no-go policy, which basically says if a player's looking like they shouldn't be out there, and if they can't compose themselves, then you can make the determination they shouldn't be out there. The Dolphins did put him back out there a few days later. You saw the thir- the, the Sunday of the quote-unquote first believed concussion. Do you think that was a concussion? Do you think that was a back? Do you have any a- any guess on what was really going on yeah. there? Does that fall into the no-go policy? Like if I'll, you're I'll, in charge, would you not have played Tua? Yeah, so I'll say this. I've been around sports. I've been around uh, injuries. I've been around a lot of different situations where you can – you might not know exactly, but you can almost pinpoint or get within the range of what the injury might be. Personally, I've never seen a back injury – that will force a player to collapse the way he did. That's the easiest way I can break that down for you. Um, Again, my concussion, same way. I remember it like it was yesterday from watching the film anyway. Um, Butt hit, head hits, whiplash, out cold. You know, you just, you just get that blunt force trauma to the back of the head and it can take you out just as easy as a, as a knee um, helmet to helmet contact. So, yeah, I mean, I've never personally seen a, a back injury, make a player collapse the way it did could have That's, been a back think, injury yeah possibly so and, and and i guess the defense of it being a back injury just from what i looked up and again i'm not a doctor here that he had his fingers tingling like this so that could be something from the higher back maybe a spine area whereas if it was a lower back injury that'd be more of a leg issue the back could talk to the hands that could be part of the back but then it could it could have been a head and a back i mean a lot of things could have been going on there but you see a player stumbling it is hard to have them out there on the Thursday. We'll see how the investigation concludes itself. I just hope we'll the see guys the okay. too. Uh, yeah, that's really the major thing is he was having a great year. He's a great young player and obviously a person more than a football player. Yeah. And you do hope he's all right because it, it didn't look good. But from CJ, it appears that he's doing well. We, we don't know how long he'll be out, but he says he's okay. Neil Brown says he's okay. It could have been much worse for him 
as well. Rasheed Marshall, Mike Austin here. It's all three phases brought to you by West Virginia Sports Now. Before we go, though, Rashid, I also want to get your take. And I teased this at the beginning. I purposely waited it to the end for people to listen to get here. I want to get your thoughts on a couple things. And this has become a debate amongst fans, mostly on Twitter. And you can take that with a grain of salt. But people are basically debating what the expectations should be for a West Virginia fan. Because now this is year four for Neil Brown and everybody and their brother discusses whether he should be around, but just off of expectations, this is year four for Neil Brown, won a bowl game a couple years ago. Last year loses a bowl game, six and seven. That first year was rough. This year right now, it's certainly in doubt if they're going to even be bowl eligible, two and three. That schedule's looking tough coming up here to even get four more wins to get to the six. So nothing's guaranteed there. West Virginia is a program, 15th winning as program in history there's major bowl victories it's a lot going on hasn't won a national title yet but we could argue the 1922 season should be claimed because they were undefeated 100 years ago a lot of success a <laughs> lot of great players like yourself a lot of down in the dumps times a lot of gut wrenching gut wrenching moments that could be brought up getting so close and not getting there but it's a program that that has a lot of rich history behind it but it's not alabama it's not Ohio State. It's not that elite program that every single season is going to be a top fiver contending for a national championship. It's in a tough conference in the Big 12, but there also are tougher conferences out there, and things are changing with who's teams coming in the conference, teams leaving the conference for the future, and who knows where West Virginia will be uh, in the coming years as well. What do you think the reasonable expectations should be for a Mountaineer fan? Should they expect a bowl game every year? Should they expect a few bowl wins after, you know, every four or five years? Should they expect to contend for a conference title? Should they expect every decade to contend to be a top 10 team or getting in the playoff or maybe even more recently? What should it be? Because it feels like it's all over the spectrum. There are some people that are upset if they're not winning a conference, which seems crazy. There are others that are saying that, hey, you shouldn't even expect a bowl appearance that if you win four or five games and you're playing cool opponents like former rivals, that should be good enough. That seems kind of low for a bar. What's your bar when you enter a season and on a regular basis, now being a fan of this team that you played for and became yeah. a legend with to expect and say, this is good. Is there a win total? Is there something to achieve? So two things right off of the bat, the first episode we recorded on yeah. this podcast, we talked about, the expectation level of the average fan, and that's pretty much from the, the the northernmost pot in West Virginia to the southernmost spot in West Virginia, um, which are exception of a few Marshall fans. Every single West Virginia fan is going to have high expectations of this program. Um, you touched on it. The 15th most winning program in the country. Um, year in and year out, you expect a lot. Um, West Virginia hasn't had a ton of down years. Obviously, we've had our right. fair share, but um, generally speaking, West Virginia is a pretty, you know, nationally respected program. Uh, you niche it down to the state of West Virginia. Tough, blue collar, hardworking, bring it every single week as a player, and you play for the fans in those stands. Um, so generally speaking, as a, as a fan, I'm, I'm pretty sure that those fans who support every single week are expecting a win every week. Now, now we have yeah. to break it down a little bit more. Yeah. You have your average fan. You have your true fans who actually understands the game. Um, you know, I think you have a little more realistic expectation. The average person just wants their team to win. I get it. I understand. But you break that down a little bit more. Okay, you understand matchups. You understand – um, what the previous team did, what their units look like, matchups, all that stuff. So, yes, the expectation level is high. But, um, you know, sometimes the perception versus reality could be a little bit different. Sure. As a former player, you know, I want to see West Virginia win every single game from start to finish throughout the season. Yeah. Is that going to be something that's truly capable? Probably not. Can we get there? Who knows? But – you know, again, right now, West Virginia is in a position to where it has to take care of what's in-house. Um, the next goal in mind is to beat Baylor. You don't worry about anything else prior or past Baylor. It's take care of your your business at Baylor. Uh, make sure, and, and that's going to be a home game. I know I've worded that a little weird, but 
That's yeah. going to be a home game for us. Take care of business. That's what it is. It's one week at a time, and that's the true perspective as a player. It's one game. You march forward, win, lose, or draw, and then from there you kind of see what's next on the table. Yeah, and players and coaches aren't worrying about this. They're, they are taking one game at a time. They're only worrying about Baylor. They're not worrying about what we need to do the rest of this season or how many wins should happen each individual year. Do you have a win total, though, to kind of narrow it down? Like, for example, you mentioned wanting to win every week, but obviously that that's not realistic to do every single season. Even Alabama loses occasionally. Right. So if, say, West Virginia would win seven games in a given year, regardless of just situation, just in general, would that be viewed as a good season to you? Or do you think the bar should be higher at eight and above on a maybe regular basis? If this team doesn't make a bowl game, is that obviously a bad year? Or do you look deeper into the schedule? Do you dissect it like that? Or do you have a win bar? Do you expect a bowl game appearance every season? Or Neil Brown being there for four years, one bowl win. If he goes five years without a second bowl victory and they don't get in one this year and the next year, for example, is is one bowl win in a five year period, regardless of you know everything else going on, because every situation is different. Is that acceptable to you? Okay, so that's a two part question right there. All right. Yeah. Now bit, yeah. the 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 goal is to make a bowl game. You want to make a bowl game. That's that's like the standard. That's the average. You okay. know, you get six to seven wins. Okay, you look back on it. We had an average season. You start to hit that eight, that nine, that 10 game tier. All right, now we're taking it to the next level. Um, you know, you become bowl eligible at six wins. Sometimes you might even see a team with a losing record get into a bowl. So that can get watered down a little bit mm-hmm. within the team, within the program, within the, as, as the leader of the organization, the head coach, Neil Brown. Yes, I think you should expect to get to a bowl game. You want to get to a top tier bowl game. Because that's how you get the recruits in. That's how you're able to attract the new guys. Alabama, they are able to recruit players. And actually, they're at the point right now to where they're turning players away. They're going to get the top talent <laughs> year in and year out. Yeah, and really? They can say, hey, listen, come on yeah. in. We're going to show you these national championship trophies. Do you want to play for one of these when you right. get here? It's not and a hard that. sell. Yeah, Neil Brown walks in. <laughs> Nick Saban walks in a room and says, hey, you want to come here? Oh, you don't? Okay, I'll, you're not going to have to. You're not going to spend too much energy trying to convince anybody. If they don't want to be with Alabama, then okay, you're, you're just going to yeah. miss out on getting somebody else. Where maybe, obviously, at a program like West Virginia or not Alabama, you do have to sometimes offer a sales pitch. Yeah. Without a doubt. So, yeah, man, I, I, I truly think that the, the tradition starts with winning records year in and year out. You're able to get the recruits in. Um, you, you take them to the Hall of Traditions. You take them down the – you know, the, the history of what that school has produced in the past and you get those guys to buy in. So um, it's, it's, it's an uphill battle right now, I think. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's not too late to get this train back on the track. But, uh, yeah, we have some work to do starting this week. Yeah, to say the least. And again, four more wins to even get bowl eligibility this season. So the work is cut out for you this year. The schedule will not be easy. You have Baylor, and then you're going to have, obviously, the matchup with Oklahoma. You never can beat the Sooners, even though maybe they're a little overrated, but you're still a team that you never can beat if you're West Virginia. And TCU's on the schedule. TCU can do it. If TCU can beat Oklahoma, (laughs) West Virginia can beat Oklahoma. If Kansas State can beat Oklahoma, West Virginia can beat Oklahoma because we've competed with those and against beat those teams in the past. And there's there's no excuse for it. I don't I don't care about the matchups. Athlete for athlete on paper, can I can't happen. say that TCU or Kansas State has better athletes than West Virginia. No, you, yeah, on paper, West Virginia should have better athletes, and historically, as a program, better than those two programs. And yeah, they they can beat Oklahoma. Then why not you? West Virginia's got close. In recent years, 13-10, that game with Devon Austin many moons ago and all the touchdowns, losing by one. They got really, really close. They haven't been able to do yet. We'll see if they can get it before Oklahoma leaves for the SEC. But there's also the perspective here not to be devil's advocate. But if TCU can beat Oklahoma, then can you beat TCU? TCU is going to be a tough game. Yeah, it's going to be a tough game to play the rest of the year as well. Texas Tech, these are tough games on the schedule. I'm going to close it here with maybe a more positive note here because obviously this team has a lot of work ahead of them. Who expectations, I guess, are irrelevant, but every everyone has a different set of expectations for this program moving on. But Neil Brown knows he's under pressure, knows the seed's getting a little hot here, and obviously a losing record and missing a bowl game. You have a solid recruiting class coming in, but it's certainly going to be hard to sell a climb. I think that's the conversation amongst mm-hmm. fans right now that are, that are kind of worried about the future of the program. But we talked earlier, 
another night game ahead. West Virginia is hosting Baylor Thursday night under the lights. West Virginia has already lost a night game. That was a Saturday night night game to Kansas earlier this year. They won a night game against Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, then losing a night game in Austin against Texas. It's been night game city for the Mountaineers this year. One good, and most of them have actually been bad for West Virginia this year. Your experience to even now looking at the excitement for this program as they're trying to turn the corner, they're trying to build things. What's the difference for the average person that's never going to experience this from playing at noon on a Saturday or just a regular afternoon game to a night game in terms of the environment, actually playing in the game, and then even preparation leading into the game? Because now as we're speaking, they're in a midst of a bye week, but then you're only going to have a few days to prepare for the next week. And they've certainly had a night game this year off a short week going into Virginia Tech. So what's the prep like? How's that different than the normal week? And then what's the experience like? Day game versus a night game. Right. So as far as prep, those days are adjusted. So yes, it's a midweek game. You kick off Thursday night. You adjust those games. So you're two days ahead of schedule. So technically your Monday is going to be like a Tuesday, so to speak. Um, Saturday is going to be like a Monday. So the coaches, you know, they, they are able to get those things into position where you mentally get into this mind frame, uh, as a player, as far as the, the, the night games, the mystique in Morgantown, I think we need to get it back, you know, because back in our time at WVU, yeah, no team wanted to come to Morgantown to play. It was rowdy. We all understand how the blue lot can get for tailgating. It's a, it's an all day party, you know? Um, as far as that being an advantage for us, I don't know if I can truly say over the past, you know, two, three, four years, whatever it's may be. Yeah, not anymore. Yeah. How much how much of an advantage has it been? So, you know, I think that's just something that we need to get back. I think that's something that we need to have on our side because it's is you you look at Virginia Tech, you can hardly hear yourself talk. And for people who has, you know, never been to Virginia Tech or you know, you, you don't get that same experience on television, but I'll be the first to tell you, we're standing shoulder to shoulder, ball is getting ready to be kicked off. You cannot hear a word in that stadium. Now, Morgantown does get rowdy. You know, we need to we need to bring the winning ways back to where we can use that as an advantage. No fan wants to sit in the stands and see a, you know, I'm not going to say a blowout, but in the second, third quarter, yeah. we're not competitive. We're not in that game and we don't have that advantage to our side. That's something that we need to utilize and and get back to, you know, being something that we can use as a as a favor for our for our winning ways. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, even to have attended some night games as a student, it's definitely a cool atmosphere. It's more fun than than a day game. It, you got obviously national TV usually in these cases that highlights the program, but maybe there's added pressure there as well because you know more people are going to be watching you. Look at all the ratings. Mm-hmm. From the backyard brawl, I also was a night game. They didn't win that one. Look at all the ratings from the game in Blacksburg for the Black Diamond Trophy. People are watching. So it adds that mystique to it. But yeah, under the Rich Rod era, even a little bit after, you go to Morgantown at night, you're in trouble. That's not been the case here in recent years. It's certainly not been the case this year. And That is something that West Virginia certainly can look to change. We'll see what the atmosphere is like. It is striped the stadium, so I imagine the fans are going to be there. It's going to be a packed house being a Thursday night. And this week, they'll have a long break ahead to prepare. So now, all the way till then, it's a bye week, but Neil Brown's preparing now. So you got basically a week and a half to prep for that game, so there will be no excuse of not being ready, like maybe the vibe was for the game in Austin Rashid, I always love talking to you, man. I know you have a lot yeah, going on stuff. in your life. You have a you have a busy schedule as well, so I'm glad we can figure out time to do this occasionally for yeah. Mountaineer Nation. I always and, look uh, forward to it. Yeah, do you have any do you have any words of wisdom or any last word or any advice you want to give? You want to talk to any? I know some players watch this, by the way. I hear some things okay. when okay. I'm there. So, do you have anything that you want to say? It's, it's it, the vibes are not good right now no matter what we say around this program i'm sure the players hear it maybe they should go social media dark right now if i were them but anything so, yeah you- I, I mean unfortunately i've been a part of a, uh of a transition year uh i want to say it was coach rod's second season um actually it was his first season if i'm not mistaken but anyway his first year was a eight. rough year yeah yeah three and eight first yeah, year. yeah three and eight so 
I'm drawing a blank. This was a long time ago at this point, but <laughs> nonetheless, yeah. it's week by week and you have to continue to grind. And, and as a player, you know, it, it's not a position you want to be in because listen, you show up, you work, you have a long off season, you're doing winter conditioning, 6 a.m. workouts, all that good stuff. Football is a game where sometimes hard work doesn't always equate to success. You have to continue to trust. You have to continue to show up every single day. And one day it's all going to just bust wide open for you. So, yeah, I mean, if there are any players listening to this, even fans listening to this, patience, one week at a time, continue to support. And, yeah, you just you just have to continue to give these guys energy because I can tell you the worst thing as a player is looking up during a, during a game that you're losing and see the, see the aisle starting to flood with people leaving the stadium. It's mm-hmm. terrible. But, uh, listen, I get it. I understand. They come out to support. They want to see some victories. They want to see some wins. They want to see excitement. But, hey, listen, as a player, if you don't produce, that's the end result. That's what you get. So there's a little bit yeah. of work to be done on both sides with that. Yeah, it's the nature of the beast. I don't think anyone's going to feel sorry for anybody. They know what they're getting into. But, yeah, it is tough to maybe get your mental right when you're dealing with the grind of a season like this and you feel like yeah. one bounce or another bounce or this moment or that call or that decision – It'd be five and zero oh right now. Instead, two and three, zero oh and two in conference play, which is the the toughest pill to swallow there. And we'll see next time we speak if they have that night game win under their belt, or maybe have another game one under their belt, or if things are changed here. It's been the ebb and flow of the season, like the ebb and flow here of the podcast. Rasheed Marshall, Mike Osti. This has been all three phases here, presented by West Virginia Sports Now. <laughs>